Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to talk about four things in my speech. Firstly, what kind of specific harm to cooperation we are talking about in this debate? Secondly, uh, whether, uh, whether it's very difficult to opt out or it's controllable. Number three, uh, whether applicants' rights are absolute in labor markets or corporations have a right to prioritize their profit. And finally, why our model rather protects applicants that they're trying to save on their side of the house. So firstly, what kind of harm are we talking about? There are, such there are many cases in which lifestyle factors do not affect revenue and profit of corporations. If that context is true, then companies do not care. Companies will hire these people. If company believes that lifestyle factors do not affect their profit, then corporation will not care and hire people. The context in which this debate happened is a corporation believe and foresee that certain part of lifestyle choices will surely affect their profits. And that's why corporation they are trying to discriminate or um, uh, make a decision not to hire these individuals. So their counter-characterization is irrelevant to this debate. So what kind of harm are you talking about? My partner, Prime Minister, is saying a lot of harm, but um, on top of that, for example, when the teachers engage with prostitution, like pay money to get sex with the teenagers, uh, what if uh, parents think right, that security or the classroom is under the strong uh, threat? Right? What if the teachers might personally possess the child upon pictures, for example? What if like, uh, the bankers or accountants engage with gambling and actually uh, are addicted to gambling? Do you trust the financial capability of these individuals? What if the uh, part of a media company like Facebook or TV corporations engage with extreme political activity like sexist or neo-Nazi or white supreme, supreme, supremacy of white individuals, for example? Do you really trust the neutrality of media? What if like, uh, uh, politicians or public figures like Jeff Bezos, the head of Amazon, engage with adultery and extramarital affairs? Do you really trust these individuals' ability to manage a corporation? The actually stock price went down when the news was found out that Jeff Bezos engaged with the extra mighty affairs that directly undermined the stock price of Amazon, for example. There are many cases in which there's a correlation between private activities and an actual uh, corporation's uh, 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 ability to create profit or client's trust, for example. No matter what they claim, how clients and consumer perceive is different. Because consumers are not logical to the extent that they can make judgments about this has nothing to do with this business. Consumers will uh, like majoritarily believe that this kind of branding will undermine their, uh, life, their li consumers' lifestyle choices, for example. And this is a realistic characterization of the correlation between uh, lifestyle choices and actual corporate revenue. Moving to the second clash points, is that is it really difficult to opt out? Their claim is like obesity, smoking, gambling, extra mental affairs, whatever. It's very hard to opt out. It's hard to change your lifestyle. That's exactly the problem. That means you lack the ability to control your lifestyle. You rely on the sm uh, smoking or drug to relieve your stress. And that's the exact point. Like, the reason why obesity is a huge problem in countries like Australia is because those who cannot manage their food habit cannot manage their team. Right? Like, why? How, how is it possible for a person who cannot manage personal food habit to manage 100 people's team or the company as a whole, for example? That, symbolic, that, that show, symbolically shows the lack of individual ability to control or, or control or supervise the, the manage and, or, or life and other factories. Moreover, it's basically the trade-off. If you continue to prioritize your lifestyle choices, then you are able to do so. You, have, you are not forced to enter the company. You can still continue your lifestyle. But if you want to prioritize entering into the company, you have to compromise something. That's fair trade-off, right? The same thing is happening in, in, in many other private institutions. Like, if you want to enter the Keio University or Todai, you have to compromise your personal lifestyle choices and commit, make a commitment to study, for example. If you like, want to have an abortion or euthanasia or suicide, you necessarily have to opt out to the Christian community. This kind of trade-off uh, is up to individual responsibility, and that's all happening all the time in many private institutions. So we believe corporations still have the right to uh, prioritize their own profit. Now, uh, clash point number three, uh, why applicants' rights are not absolute in a labor market. Number one, companies do not have a duty to hire people in the first place. Corporations are not forced to hire people. They have a choice not to hire people in the first place. So it's very uh, natural that companies still uh, prioritize their corporate autonomy to defend their rights, defend the existing employees and existing shareholders. Because existing employees and shareholders have already made a contribution to companies and survival of the companies. These people's rights and interests are far more important rather than, like, rather than uh, conceptual rights about applicants' rights in the labor market. 
Secondly, there are a lot of jobs in the labor market in the context of Abenomics, for example. Like, it's relatively easy for uh, like new grad students to find a job compared to two years ago or three years ago. There are a lot of jobs in the context of globalization. There are like so many industries, so many tech companies, for example. You can't say that we have no options, we cannot like, get a job in like GAFA, for example. Yeah? Like, that, that's no uh, realistic contextualization. Do you have any point of information? Okay, okay, okay. 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 Uh, and, and finally, why our paradigm rather protects applicants? The, the concession from our position is we have to protect the applicants' rights. We are better able to do so because we can reduce mismatching between applicants and companies. What happens on the, their side of the house after entering the company? Please imagine the situation. You are a smoker, but all the other workers are, no, are non-smokers. You become minority in the corporations. This communication happens. There's invisible communication barriers. There's a small chances in which you get promoted in a company, right? That's, that actually happened in a case of Nitere. One announcer used to work at Hostess in Ginza. She was rejected by Nitere, but she sued the company. She made a litigation, and she entered the Nitere as an announcer. But what happened was, no one was supporting her. No one was cooperating with her inside the company. And that's going to happen. You will be marginalized as a social minority inside the corporation. You will confront a huge barriers when you conduct business. But what happened under our model is that companies that see no problem about smoking will hire smokers. Companies that see no problem about like, uh, drinking will hire uh, uh, drinkers. Therefore, individuals are better able to strike the balance between rights and public's uh, duty under our model. Why is this important? It's important because the rights of individuals are only important when individuals are able to exercise that kind of rights. So where we are able to increase the chances in which individuals are freely exercise their rights without any barriers in the corporation and the workplace. Therefore, our model will rather uh, protect individuals and reduce the mismatch between applicants' interests and the corporations' uh, work environment. We are happy to propose. Thank you.